SCG Church. My name is Autumn, and we're so glad that you're here. If this is your first time at SCG, welcome. Please stop by our Welcome Center in the lobby to learn what we're all about and get to know some of our friendly staff and volunteers. We have a lot going on at SCG Church that we want you to know about. First, the ladies are putting together our second annual Mother's Day Tea on May 11th. We know it's early, but we want to give you time to start gathering your gals and getting ready. We sold out last year, so we've added more tables, but you're going to want to reserve yours early. Fancy ladies, teacups, maybe a fascinator or two, what could go wrong? Okay, now for the guys. The annual men's retreat is back. They are headed to the beautiful Catalina Island on April 26th through 28th. There, away from the rush of daily life, our pastors will guide them in discovering what it means to be a man of God. Space is limited, so sign up today. Each of these events is on our website, and there are folks ready to answer your questions at our tables in the courtyard, so get signed up. Oh, and in case you thought we forgot the kids, here at SCG, we value the hearts and minds of our little ones. That is why we began this journey of our SCG Christian School. We are committed to providing a safe and biblically grounded education for your kids. This year, we are making our classes available for TK, kindergarten, and first grade. So if you are interested in registering your kid or learning more about our school, visit our webpage. Now for the good stuff. Easter is coming and we are so excited for you to experience it with us. Easter is a special time for us to celebrate Jesus and how he changed everything. So invite your family, friends, and neighbors. Our Good Friday worship night will be held on Friday, March 29th at 6.30 p.m. And our Easter services on Saturday, March 30th at 5 p.m. and Sunday at 9 a.m. and 10.45 a.m. So save the dates and we'll see you there. If you are interested in discovering ways that you can serve others here at SCG, we'd love to have you join one of our volunteer teams. Scan this QR code or the one on the card in your seat back to help us get you plugged in to the right spot. We want to say thank you for generously supporting the work God is doing here at SCG. You can give online or in person at the black offering boxes on your way out. And if you need prayer, head on over to our prayer and care corner in the lobby. We care about what God is doing in your life and we'll be ready to pray for you. There's always a lot going on here at SCG that you can be a part of. So stay up to date on the latest events by checking out all the tables on the courtyard, following us on our social media pages, and visiting us on our website at scgchurch.org. Well, hello, Seacoast Grace. It's real good to see you. Can you stand to your feet? We've come to magnify the Lord in this place. And if you're ready to join in with us, can you clap your hands like this? Come on. Wherever you are on campus or if you're watching online,
this with us. You said your love will never give up. You said your grace is always enough. You said your heart will never forget or forsake. You're never forsaken, yeah. And you said I'm saved. You call me yours. You said my future is full of your hope. You never fail, so I
um, worship, let's remember the joy we have is because we have a God that fights our battles for us. Let's worship together. See, the weapon may be formed, but it won't prosper. When the darkness falls, it won't prevail. Because the God I serve knows only how to triumph. See, my God will never fail. Can you say that again? Say, my God. My God will never fail. Yeah. See, I'm going to see a victory. I'm going to see a victory. For the battle belongs to you, Lord. I'm gonna see a victory. I'm gonna see a victory. For the battle belongs to you, Lord. It belongs to you, Lord. So we turn the fight over to you, yes. Come on, let's worship. Say there's power in the name.
Christ is my firm foundation The rock on which I stay When everything around me is shaking Oh, I've never been more glad
Yes, Jesus, we believe in the history that God, anything that you have said, you have done. And there's so many more things that you're going to do. And God, we are so excited to be part of your word that never fails. We're excited to stand upon a rock instead of the sinking sand this world promises. God, your promises stand truer. So Lord, we love you, we thank you, we stand upon you this morning. And everybody said... Amen. You guys may take a seat. Amen. Good morning. Oh, got it? No. Oh. All right. Well, glad you guys are here this morning. Uh, one more quick announcement. If you didn't see, we have an open house for our SEG school after the services. If you're picking up your kids right off the, the right-hand side of the lobby, they're going to uh, show you kind of what the classrooms look like. So if you don't know, um, we're kind of slowly opening school, uh, another grade each year. So next year, we're going to have TK, kindergarten, and first grade, and we're still working on preschool. So if you have kids in that age, go check it out. It's going to be parents who had kids at the school this last year and they'll tell you how it was and you can kind of meet some of the, the folks that are part of that community. So um, check that out. They may even be bribing you with some food if you go in there, which may be the best mac and cheese I've ever had in my life, but whatever. Uh, okay, so um, I have a conversation this week with a friend of mine and he asked me this question, very simple question, but I found it difficult to answer. What do you do for fun? And my initial thought was, I have children. I don't do fun right now. I, I focus on kids. Uh, but I was thinking about, well, growing up, I did a lot of things that were fun. Being in Southern California, I'd get to do all the fun, you know, sports surf and snowboard and dirt bike and, and, and all those fun things. And, you know, as I've gotten older, they've kind of disappeared a little bit. It's probably not a bad thing. I wasn't like great at those things. I had a lot of fun at them, but I wasn't always as good as some of the other kids. There was always those kids who, um, I don't know if it was natural ability or there was something else, but they excelled at all of those things. And so I was trying to figure out what was it about them that made them better than me at all of those things. And there was a natural ability, but there was also this piece in which they weren't afraid to just send it when everybody else was. Like if the, the set wave is coming in and you're going, you know, I'm going to let this one pass they're on it. Or there's a jump that they want to take, or they, they just seem to be the kid who they were just missing that piece of fear that the rest of us had. And I think when it comes to following Jesus, that's kind of what it means to follow Jesus, is you've got to send it. You've got to get uncomfortable. You have to just say, all right, I don't care what it costs me. I'm going to go for it. Because as a, as a follower of Jesus, I don't want to be mediocre. I'm not even sure if you can be mediocre. I think you're kind of in or, or you're not. And that's what we've been talking about in this series that we're going to be finishing today, but really is the theme for the rest of the year is uh, send it, is we want to be people who are getting outside of our comfort zone. We're not holding anything back as we follow Jesus. And, and we've highlighted three ways in which we can do that. First one is by serving. We've given you guys opportunities, and of course you can take uh, advantage of those anytime, is just by plugging in somewhere in, here at Seacoast and serving. Or uh, we've talked about sharing, is we want to get out there and we want to share the message of Jesus with people. And then finally, sacrificing is we want to use our resources in order to continue to push that message forward. And so our anchor verse has been and continues to be and will be for the rest of the year is this, is John 20, 21. Again, Jesus said, peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, I am sending you. And so Jesus says, I was sent by the Father from heaven to earth in order to accomplish a mission and have a message. And then now I'm sending you out in order to continue what I have started. And so we're going to look at a, a passage today. One of my favorites is in Matthew 10. And I think it summarizes this whole idea pretty well. And if you're not familiar with the Bible and kind of what's taking place in here is you have 12 disciples, 12 guys that are following Jesus around, watching kind of who he is and what he does. And as they observe him and they learn about who he is, he turns them and he says, now I want you to go out and I want you to do what I've been doing. I want you to just go out and tell people about me. And so we'll jump into uh, our scripture there. Uh, Matthew 10 verse 5 says this, these 12 Jesus sent out. And so we already know that Jesus is going to send them out. And he told them he was going to because he told them on day one when they decided to follow him. So if you go back a couple chapters to Matthew 4 and he starts to call some of the disciples, here's what he says. This is day one before they even sign up to be a part of what Jesus is doing. He says, come, follow me, Jesus said, and I will send you out to fish for people. 
So here's what he says. Day one, you're going to do two things if you want to be my disciple. You are going to follow, and then I'm going to send you out. Two things, follow and send, follow and send. Those are the two things that you're going to do as a disciple. And then he gives them these instructions. He says this, he says, Do not go among the Gentiles or enter any town of the Samaritans. Go rather to the lost sheep of Israel. And so if you're not familiar with the Bible, you might be going, well, wait a minute. Why is he just sending him to this select group of people? Well, the short answer is it's because these are the people that are waiting and looking for the Messiah, Jesus. And so they're waiting, they're looking. He says, well, go tell them that I'm here. Because the story of the scripture is the story of God bringing humanity back to himself, reconciling humanity to himself. And so he starts with a man that becomes a family, that becomes a nation of Israel. And he promises that he's going to send a savior. And so they're waiting, they're ready. The savior has arrived. And so he says, go tell them that I'm here. Now, very quickly, he tells everybody else. He talks to the apostle Paul and he says, Paul, I want you to go tell everyone else, all the Gentiles about my arrival. But he starts with the people that are waiting for him. Verse seven, as you go, proclaim this message. The kingdom of heaven has come near. I read a stat this week that 40%, uh, 47% of Christians thought it was, and this isn't that they didn't do it, it's they thought that it was wrong to share their faith. 47% of people who call themselves Christians go, I, I'm, I shouldn't tell other people about Jesus, which is kind of weird. I mean, even on a practical level, I think, well, if Jesus really is who he says he is and he really does change your life, don't you want other people to know? But not only, I think, practically, but just what Jesus has to say is totally against that. Jesus goes, no, that's kind of what we were going to do. You're going to follow me, and then I'm going to send you out in order to share this message with other people. Now, what is the message? Well, here he says, tell them that the kingdom of God has come near. Most of us don't know what that means. It's because you kind of have to understand the big picture of the scriptures. And so let me sketch it out, and it'll be a review for, for many of you is we were created to live in God's creation. It's his kingdom, and he is the king over all. And he gives us an opportunity and and, and free will to we can choose if we're going to follow him and serve him as king, or we're going to reject him and we're going to be the kings of our own little kingdoms. We're going to be the rulers of our own lives. Very quickly, humanity decides, I don't want want you to rule, I want to rule. And ever since then, that's what humanity has been doing over and over again, is I don't want you to tell me what to do, I'm going to do what I want to do. And as a consequence of us rejecting God, there's this thing called sin that enters in the world and sin then results in death and decay. And and when Jesus arrives, what he's saying is the king of all creation is bringing his creation back under his rule where he's going to start putting things back together. And I am the king over all. Jesus is declaring himself king. The kingdom is here with his arrival. And so we have a decision to make. Do we want to continue to live in rebellion against God and be the king and queens of our own little kingdom? Or are we going to submit to the ultimate ruler, Jesus? So those of us who have decided to follow Jesus and allow him to be the ruler of our lives, he then sends us out and he says, now go and tell other people the good news that the king has returned and is bringing the kingdom back to himself. Verse 8, he says, heal the sick raise the dead, cleanse those who have leprosy, drive out demons, freely you have received, freely give. Now, we've talked about the supernatural and miracles and all that, and we'll leave that for another day, but I want to get to kind of the the basics here of what he's saying. Is He first told us, if you're going to be my follower, then you need to go out and you need to share. Well, now he says, I'm sending you out in order to serve, because that's really what this is about, is taking what is broken in the world and putting it back together. Because that's what God ultimately is doing. And so when you go out into the world, I want you to look around and see who is broken, who is struggling physically, relationally, emotionally, definitely spiritually. And I want you to use your resources and my power in order to bring restoration into the world, to bring hope and healing. So what he's ultimately saying is, I want you to go out and I want you to just give your life away. And I don't want you to be stingy with it. I gave you your life and I'm going to direct you of what you're going to do with it. And so I gave it to you freely and I want you to freely just give your life away. I want you to give your time and your energy and your resources in order to bring healing into the world. Now, this is a very countercultural message, especially for us today. Because what the world tells us is this life is about you. It's about meeting your needs and your wants and your desires and your goals. Everything revolves around you. And Jesus comes along and he goes, no, it's not about you. In fact, I just want you to give your life away to anybody in need. Doesn't matter if they deserve it. Doesn't, just, just start giving your life away. 
And what he says is, he says, if you do that, you're actually going to find what you've been looking for. So when you make your life all about you, you're looking for satisfaction and fulfillment and purpose, and you're never going to find it if you make your life about you. But if you start giving away your life for my sake, you're actually going to find those things. It's countercultural. It's counterintuitive. Is this the way of Jesus? Is he said, give your life away, and you're going to find your life. Verse nine, he gives this, this kind of. This is kind of odd. It's kind of out of nowhere. He says, do not get. Any gold or silver or copper to take with you in your belts. No bag for the journey or extra shirt or sandals or a staff. And so he sends him out and he says, I don't want you to take any resources. I'm sending you out to sacrifice. So he says, I'm sending you to serve. I'm sending you to share and I'm sending you to sacrifice. Why does he not want them to have any resources, any material goods? It's not that they don't have these things or they couldn't get a hold of these things. He explicitly says, I don't want you to take any of those things with you. Why? Well, because they are a lot like us, and they are addicted to, to stuff, to money. In fact, we're so addicted to it that we may begin to trust in it as our Savior. And he wants us to be completely free from any attachment to our stuff, to our money, to our resources. Because what happens is, and I think this is so genius of Jesus, he says, look, I want to be the ultimate authority of your life. And I want you to find, and we talked about this a couple weeks ago, I want you to find your significance, satisfaction, and security in me. I'm the only one who can provide it. But what money does, and this is why Jesus talks about money so much, is what money does is it becomes what's called a pseudo-savior. It promises to do what only God can do. And will come into our life, and whether we can acknowledge it and see it, it says, if you bow down to me, you make your life about me, I'm going to give you what your heart truly desires. Now, we know that's not true, but we don't live like that. We live as if money is going to give us all those things that only Jesus can. And so what Jesus wants to do is he wants us to get to a place in which we can come into this life with our resources. And instead of being like this, because this is how most of us are with our money. We're like, we're just, oh, we're white knuckling it. Whether we have a lot of it or we have a little of it, it doesn't matter. We're just like this. It's my money. I'm going to determine what I do. I'm going to try to make more of it. It's mine. And Jesus goes, no, no, no. Here's how you're going to find freedom, like this. I just want you to go through life like this with your resources. All right, what do you want me to do? This is your money. It's not my money. What do you want? And for them, he says, I want you to get rid of all of it. I don't want you to have any of it. Just what's on on your back is all you're going to go with. Now, let's just do a thought experiment. Let's imagine that tonight you go home and you have a little prayer time and you feel something that you've never felt before. It's almost as if God's talking to you and he says, I want you to sell everything that you have and give it away. Like all of it, your house, your retirement funds, your savings, everything. I want you to just have the shirt on your back. What's your response going to be? I need to make a doctor's appointment. Something is not right with me. I feel very, oof, I feel very uncomfortable I'm thinking of these thoughts. Why? Because the disciples were told that, and Jesus said it to other people. And the, depending on their response is really where, where they stood with Jesus. So the disciples looked at it and went, okay, that sounds like an adventure. Where are we going, Jesus? What are we doing? This is going to be, this is going to be hairy. This is going to be a little bit crazy. But we're going to send it because that's what it means to follow Jesus is we're going to get uncomfortable. And so the first thing that, that he tells them to get uncomfortable with is their money. All right, I want you to just give it away. I want you to trust that I'm going to provide for you. In fact, that's what he says in this next verse. He says this. He says, for the worker is worth his keep. So as you're going out there and you're serving people and you're sharing this message and you're sacrificing everything that you have, I'm going to take care of you. And the way that I'm going to provide for you is people, they're not everybody, but people are going to receive the message that the king has come that they can be reconciled to the creator and they're going to see it as such good news that they, they can't help but give you money so that it will fuel the ministry forward. Which makes sense. Is, if this really is true, what, more, what, what better are you going to spend your money on? You get some more junk that you get to throw away in a few years? No. He goes, this is the most important thing. When people get, grasp that and they start to understand it and begins to change them, that's what they're going to want to do. And it makes sense practically, whether you're a Christian or not, this makes sense as you're going to give to the things in which you prioritize, right? I said a couple weeks ago is um, most people give to the government first. Why? Because they prioritize their freedom. They don't want to go to jail. And then they give to their family because they prioritize them and they give to the... But what's weird is we say we prioritize Jesus first, and yet he doesn't make the list. Jesus is saying, no, 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 no. Give 
according to your priorities. And so that's why he calls us to give to the local church. As he says, I want you to give to the thing that is changing not only your life, but changing the community that you live in. And so myself and our staff and everybody else, and if you're a believer, that's why we give to the local church and we invest so much time and energy because this is the thing that he said is going to change the world or at least change our community is the local church. Which I think is just, if I were God, I would just look at it and go, that's, I don't know if that's going to work. Have you seen these people? I mean, they're a mess. They're a disaster. That's how you're going to change the world. You're going to entrust them with this life-changing message. But that's what he decided. He said, it's going to be you. It's going to be me. It's going to be us. It's up to us in order to go out there and to share and to um, serve and to sacrifice. He says uh, in verse 11, Whatever town or village you enter, search there for some worthy person and stay at their house until you leave. As you enter the home, give it your greeting. If the home is deserving, let your peace rest on it. If it is not, let your peace return to you. So the idea is, Jesus says, look where God's at work, and then I want you to go there. I want you to find the people that are most open to this message, because God is constantly at work with people around you. Whether they believe in him or not, whether they know it or not, God is stirring people's hearts. And so we want to be attentive and aware all the time of, okay, who is God working in and how can I partner with God in what he's doing? And oftentimes it comes in the least expected places. Last week I was sitting in my brother-in-law's living room, who is the head of Next Generation, he's pastor, and then my dad and then myself. And we're having a discussion and he had to have somebody come and inspect something on his house. So the guy knocks on the front door and he comes in the living room and immediately he sees me because I'm kind of the closest this one to the door and he looks at me and he kind of gives this like mm, who I think I know you somewhere he says are you the are you that pastor from Seacoast and I said yeah I am and he goes oh and then he looks over and he sees my dad and he goes you're a pastor too and he looks at Matt and he goes you're I think you're you're on the announcements I think that's a pastor I don't know what that is but you're there too I said, yeah, have you been to Seacoast? And so we started dialogue. Yeah, I came and I checked it out. And I asked him, you know, where he was in his faith and if he had been back to church and he hadn't. And at the end of the conversation, I said, hey, can I ask you one more question? If God were trying to get your attention, what do you think he would do? He goes, I don't know, maybe like walk into a living room and three pastors are sitting there. I said, that's pretty good. I think that would probably get my attention. And it doesn't have to be that obvious. Um, it happens in everyday conversations. I was in a conversation yesterday with some parents I just met at a baseball game. All our kids were playing together. And, and we were just talking, and I was asking about their story and their life and kind of where they're at. And they, they mentioned that they were taking care of their elderly mother, and they had to drive her to church. I said, oh, that's interesting. What church? Do you guys go to church? And, oh, we'd been a couple times and whatever. And I said, well, I go to church too. I said, oh, really, what church you could, oh, this great church over at Seacoast, the pastor is amazing. You should go check this out, but he's great. And, uh, and just, just kind of dropped it in conversation to see if they're interested. And he goes, oh, yeah, I've heard about them. And I heard you have a, yeah, you should check it out sometime. Just being open. You just, you never know. All right, verse 14. He's going to show up and he's going to be like, what is happening? Is that the... All right, all right. So, uh, if anyone will not welcome you or listen to your words, leave that home or town and shake the dust off your feet. Truly, I tell you, it'll be more bearable for Sodom and Gomorrah on the day of judgment than for that town. So, here's the good news for those of us who are going to go out and share. It's not our responsibility to convince people. It's our responsibility to just simply share to the best of our ability and with love. Jesus says, and he uses this parable, he says, when we go and we share this message, it's kind of like seed, and it lands on different types of soil. And so you have the the hard soil, and the rocky, and the thorny, and then you have the good soil. And so the good soil will receive the message, but the rest are going to reject it one way or another. And, And you don't have to worry about that, because that's between them and God. Your job is simply just to go out and to share. I have a friend this week who needs to have some difficult conversations. He doesn't want to do it. He goes, I already know how this is going to go. They're not going to respond well. It's going to not. I said, look, that's not your deal. Your deal is not to, uh, is you're not responsible for how they respond. You're responsible for, have you done what you're supposed to do? Have you, have you shared? Have you had the conversation? Have you had the dialogue? Whether they respond well or not, did you go and have it? And did you have it in love and in truth? Because that's all that God expects from us. Now, here's the problem. 1127, we've got... A little 13, what is it, 13, 15, 17 minutes, right? I could end right here. We could be done for the day. And some of you guys are rejoicing in your mind, thinking, oh my goodness, he's ending early. Don't kid yourself, that's not going to happen. Um, 
but this is normally where I would end my sermon. I'd go, okay, now go out there and share your faith. And a lot of you would walk out going, okay, that sounds like a good idea, but I have no idea how to do that. Because when it comes to the other two, when it comes to serving and sacrificing, those things are pretty obvious what to do. You go and you volunteer somewhere here, or you, you, you start writing checks and you start giving things away. And those are, now they're hard to do. And unfortunately, most people are not going to do those things, but you know what you're supposed to do. But when it comes to sharing, that part you might go, I would even like to do those things. I just have no clue how to do it. And the bummer is Jesus doesn't tell us how to do it. He gives us no insight into how we're supposed to share our faith. He just says that we're supposed to do it. And I think it's because it's going to change from person to person and culture to culture and time to time. And so I want to just give you a couple of things that make sense to me and maybe they'll be helpful for you of how we can begin this process of telling people about Jesus. And I want to use our three phrases that we use all the time here. The three phrases are that Jesus changes everything, live differently, and send it. I want to use those as sort of the... The, the starting point for some ways that we can tell people about Jesus. So the first one, Jesus changes everything. Well, I think the way that you can let them know that Jesus changes everything is, and this should be an easy step, is let them know you go to church. Now, hopefully they're aware that you go to church, but maybe you're new, maybe you're not sure, you know, you're just checking it out. But a really easy way to open up a, a spiritual conversation is just letting people know, I go to church. Now, you don't have to say it like that. You can be a little bit more, uh, like, okay, I heard a story, and I'd love to know who this mom was. I told it at our, we had a volunteer party the other day. It was a, a mom who was at the local park here, and she's having her kids, and they're playing, and they're having a great time. And then another mom comes up, and then their kids begin to play, and so the moms start talking. And as they're wrapping up their time, the one mom says to the other, hey, we have to go. And she could have left it at that, you know, we have something else going on. But she said, we have to go because we have church right now. I love just dropping that line. We have church and kind of like, what do you think about, you know, like, what is, anyway, and she goes, oh, you go to church. Well, what church do you go to? I'm new in the area. I would love to check out a church. She goes, oh, well, we go to Seacoast. Why don't you just come with us? And came with her, got plugged in, is now part of our church. And it was just something as simple as that is, hey, I got to run because I got church. Just, just dropping it in there. You never know who might be interested or just let them know that you're a Christian. We talk about uh, the, you know, the gear that we have, uh, especially the Jesus changes everything stuff. And it's just a conversation piece. It's just a way for you to step into place and people will look at it and they may not say anything, but they go, oh, okay, maybe they're into this Jesus thing. That's interesting. Amy, Amy has much better luck with uh, conversations than I do. I don't know if I'm unapproachable, but no one wants to talk to me when I'm wearing Jesus changes everything, but she does. So we're, uh, we're shopping for new glasses for me and she's wearing a Jesus changes everything. And there's an elderly lady who is sitting there getting glasses as well. And she goes, <gasps> Jesus, huh? And then Amy just, of course, is going to be an introduction like, yes, Jesus, what do you want to know about Jesus, you know? But because it's just a very simple, non-confrontational. The best one that I've heard is a buddy of mine. It was over a decade now when I was in seminary, first day of class, and we're all talking about why we're there and a little bit of our story. And he says, well, my name is Beckett, and I lived as a gay man for 25 years in West Hollywood. And then Jesus grabbed a hold of me, and now I want to go into ministry. And so I said, can we, can we talk later? I would love to hear more of your story. And so his story is that he was out with some friends at a local coffee shop, and they're having a great conversation. They look at the table next to him, a bunch of young guys, and they all have Bibles, and they're reading their Bibles. And he turns to them and he goes, I've lived here for 25 years. I've never seen a Bible out in public in L.A. Do you really believe that thing? Because he's an atheist. They go, yeah, we do believe this. In fact, why don't you come and sit with us for a little bit, and we can tell you about it. And he reluctantly does, and then they invite him to church, and he goes to church for the first time, and he hears the gospel message, and then God gets a hold of him. He is convicted that he needs to become a Jesus follower. He does. Now he's in ministry. He's writing books. I mean, just an amazing story. And it started with a couple guys that said, hey, let's do our Bible study at the local coffee shop, because you never know who might ask. Just letting people know, hey, we're here if you have questions. And then eventually let them know your story. When I get to tell people my story, my faith journey— um, it's oftentimes not as a pastor. Because whenever I tell people I'm a pastor, that pretty much shuts down conversation right there. They just go, okay, well, you're not my friend. <laughs> okay, well, bye. Um, it's usually when I'm asking them questions about their story. And I'm genuinely interested. And I go, tell me about it. And eventually they'll t talk about a place of need that they have. And if I can relate to that need, I'll tell them, hey, here's how Jesus has helped me with that. 
Whether it's a marriage issue, it's kids that are off the rails, it's dealing with a loss or addiction or broken, whatever it might be, we can relate. And if, if we're followers of Jesus, we can go, hey, here's how Jesus brought hope and healing into my life. And they might go, that's nice, not interested. No, no big deal. Or they might go, well, you know, I'd like to learn a little bit more about that. Great. Second thing is uh, live differently. Let them see that we live differently. One of the main things that uh, drew people to the faith initially in the first couple of centuries was how Christians lived differently than the rest of culture. There would be these plagues that would come in and they would just decimate and wipe out cities. And as everyone is fleeing to the countryside, it would be the Christians that would come in at the risk and oftentimes the cost of their own life in order to care for the sick. And people started taking notice and going, what's up with these people? They don't live like anyone else. And it wasn't just these dramatic things. It was also the day-to-day things. Tim Keller summarized it like this, and I think this is great insight because it's still true today. He says, The early church was strikingly different from the culture around it in this way. The pagan society was stingy with its money and promiscuous with its body. A pagan gave nobody their money and practically gave everybody their body. And the Christians came along and gave practically nobody their body, and they gave practically everybody their money. Is that not true today? Is if we treated money and sex differently, and we didn't have to tell anybody anything and tell them they're messing up, we just live differently, they're going to take notice. And they're going to say, there's something different about these people. It can happen through our, our lifestyle. Is I, um, one of the conversations I get to have with people is, if they don't know that I'm a pastor, is at the end of these sports seasons, uh, my kids, the teams that they play on, there's usually a party. This is the most recent one, is there's a party and kids are playing and then the parents are just bringing out all the alcohol. And so they're pouring it to everybody at the table and I'm saying, and they get to me and they go, uh, would you like some? And I say, oh, no, thank you, I don't drink. And you know what they always respond with is, oh, are you in recovery? <laughs> so I've learned to respond, yes, I'm in recovery. Um, I'm addicted to myself and so I'm trying to overcome that. And they go, <laughs> right? And I go, let me explain. It's just, I've had so many conversations, and I'm not saying you can't drink, and I'm not saying the Bible's against it. I'm just saying that's a decision I made, and I have seen so many people intrigued by the fact that I just don't drink. And so I've decided I'm not going to drink, because it's a great conversation starter. Or if you're single, or you're dating, and all of your friends move in together, and they're sleeping together before they get married, and you just go, no, no, we're doing it God's way. We're just going to wait. And they may not understand it initially. In fact, they may mock you. But here's what I've seen is uh, about five years, 10 years into your marriage, when they're struggling and you have done it God's way, and you seem to have a healthy, thriving marriage, they're going to come to you and go, so what did you do different? You go, oh, well, let's talk about that. Because we did it God's way, and, and, you know, it seems to work out a lot better. Let them see it in your character. When you're at work and maybe you don't make the same jokes, you don't use the same language, you don't cut those corners, the shady practices, the gossip. And again, you don't have to say a word, you don't have to condemn, you don't even have to give that nasty look and like, mm, I'm self-righteous. It's just like, no, I just live differently than everybody else. My character is different. And I want my character to be different. My son, uh, this last year, he got sick and we went to the doctor, they gave him some medicine and we got home and we were gonna give him the medicine. And we said, okay, buddy, you need to take your steroids. And he went, oh no, dad, I'm a baseball player. I don't take steroids. And I said, oh, okay. Uh, First of all, you're eight. (laughs) No one's guessing you're juicing. You're 50 pounds, buddy. Uh, I think you'll be all right. He's like, my team would be so disappointed in me. I'm like, I think you'll be all right, dude. But I love that. I love that character where he's like, no way, dad. Uh Uh-uh, what's right is right. What's wrong is wrong. And, you know, I can't do that. What if we just had that attitude at work where, you know, he's not not condemning anybody else. He's just saying, hey, here's who I am. Here's where I stand. Or let him see us uh, live differently through our resources, how we spend our money and our time and our energy. The the volunteer party I mentioned earlier, we had a a few hundred volunteers. We just celebrated the fact that they're doing such a good job. And I had a lady come up to me during that party, and she says, you know, I spend hours and hours here every week. And my friends think I'm crazy. They just go, no, you go and you just give all of your time. She goes, no, it's worse than that. I pay them for me to come and to volunteer there. And they just go, what are you doing? That's, that's crazy. She says, what they don't understand is what an incredible joy it is to be able to serve. I mean, I get to use my time and my resources to make a kingdom impact. There's nothing better than that. Or when it comes to our priorities. 
I'm in the life stage, and I know many of you are, where um, we're pulled in lots of different directions, especially by our children. And so I had a family come up to me yesterday, and they said, hey, uh, our kids are pretty good at this sport. They're thinking about joining this travel team, but we're not really sure what to do. How are you navigating it? And I don't have it figured out, but here's kind of what we're doing is we're saying, okay, let's start with the goal. Let's start with our priorities. What do we want? What we want is we want children who become adults who love Jesus. Number one, that's what I want. I don't care if they're good at any sports, and I don't even care if they're mediocre at school. I know that's heresy. I apologize. But what I care about first and foremost is, do they love Jesus? Okay, well then, if that's my top priority, I'm putting that in my schedule first. And so the first thing I put in there is, look, you're not missing church services. We're going to be here. We're not missing events. You're going to be at X, Y, and Z. So we put that in our calendar first, and then we go, okay, now can baseball fit into there? Oh, there's a little bit of conflict. So you know what we do? We tell the coach he won't make it during those times. And if he can't be on the team, that's okay. And I also remind him, you will look like me. You have no shot at professional sports at all. (laughs) So relax, dude. But... We put that in first, and then we make everything else adjust to that, not vice versa. Here's what we prioritize. Here's who we want to be, and so that's what we're going to aim for. And then, of course, our attitude. I don't know if you've noticed this, but there is a little bit of uh, political division happening in our country. And I've heard there may be some more coming up this year. I don't know. We'll see. But wouldn't it be amazing if Christians were known for not their political agenda and their political opinions, although you can have those and it's great and you should, but that shouldn't be the first thing that we're known by. What is the first thing that Jesus says we should be known by? Our love. And so what if we stood in the gap and we go, look, I understand that you have this political opinion. I may not even agree with you. I may vehemently disagree with you, but you know what? My priority in life is not to have my political party win. My priority is for you to know Jesus. And so I'm going to make sure that you know I love you and that Jesus loves you. And then if we need to talk about politics down the line, we can. We may not need to. Because that's where I'm going to spend my moral capital. That's where I'm going to spend my influence. It's not for politics. It's always going to be for Jesus. It's always silent after I make that point. All services so far have been very silent during that. Okay. Not even a giggle out of you. All right. All right. Last one is send it. So this is the last thing is eventually you have to get to a place. And if our aim is to have people know Jesus, we have to invite them to their next steps. This is what Jesus did. And whenever he had encountered somebody, he would invite them. Here's kind of your next step. It could be follow me. It could be, but he had a next. And so we have to discern and we have to decide where this person is and if they're open to it. But if they are, we have to invite them to their next step. So their next steps might be something like, hey, do you want to come to church with me? And just simple as that. In two weeks, we have a great opportunity. Two times a year, Christmas and Easter, in which people are most uh, open to coming to church. And so this is a great opportunity. This is a season where people are going to go, okay, yeah, I might come. And so maybe it's as simple as an invitation. And one of the best things is when people show up here for the first time, and I've noticed this happening a lot lately, and they come from a Catholic background that they haven't been to since they were children. It's like my favorite. And they went, the last time they were in a church was Latin mass. And then they walk in here and they just go, what? This is not church. I don't think Jesus approves of this. I'm not sure what's going on here. But then they kind of start to figure it out. They go, okay, yeah, yeah, I get it. I understand. These people are a lot like me. And I, I kind of like this. I come understand. I'm not sure if I believe what they believe, but it's not weird. And they just need to show up and see what we're about. Or maybe the next step for them is they're ready to follow Jesus. They're there and they just need somebody to guide them. And so you just get that opportunity, which is if you've ever done this with someone, you say, you know, do you want to follow Jesus? They say, yes. You go, let's pray. We can do it right now. It doesn't have to be this big, crazy, it's just this thing right now where we say, Jesus, my life is yours. I need your forgiveness of my sins. I dedicate my life to you. Simple as that. But when you get to be a part of that, you're you're witnessing a miracle in that moment. But we have to be willing. We have to be willing to send it, which is going to make us really uncomfortable at times. And so this coming year, this is going to be where we're going, is we are people who do not want to be mediocre Christians. I'm, again, I'm not even sure if that's a thing or not. We want to be people who at the end of our lives get to look back and we get to go, dude, I sent it. I sent it. I, I left nothing out there. I completely went and I was all in for Jesus. And then I tried to bring as many people with me as possible. And so that's the question. Is, are you going to be a person who is going to send it? Or are you going to be a person that's comfortable? Let's pray. Lord God, 
we thank you for we thank you for this community and uh, just so many people who are in this church that love you and uh, their lives are all about you and they just can't wait to share that news with other people. And for those of us who might be a little bit uh, comfortable, we might be a little bit lazy when it comes to our faith, we want to be people who hold nothing back, that everything is yours, all of our resources, all of our time, all of our energy, and that we get up every day and we just say, Lord, use me, help me to share this good news with other people. And Lord, I, I just thank you in advance for what you're going to do, and we're, we're so thankful for what you've been up to already. In your name we pray. Amen. All right, you guys, uh, thank you for being here this weekend. Stop by the open house on your way out, and we'll see you next weekend. God bless.